Hi students, welcome to Science Extension. And this is module one, where we look at the foundations of scientific thinking. Our first video is gonna focus on what is science. So that, I guess, brings us to a bit of a conversation around some of the misconceptions associated with science. Many of our recent experiences in dealing with the COVID pandemic, along with the increasing frequency and severity of extreme weather events, Hurricane Ian, give it a rest, have provided a glimpse at some of the misconceptions associated with science. Some of these important misconceptions I've put into a few different sorts of headings. The first heading, hypotheses, theories and laws. Probably the most common misconception is the linear relationship between hypothesis, theory and law. You get this idea or it's maybe a bit of a guess, maybe an educated guess and you do a little bit of experimentation on it and then you just kind of develop this hypothesis into a theory and then with a bit more evidence, a little bit more, more people doing it, wider um, types of experiments, maybe you reach a point where you've you've discovered a law of science or a law of the universe. Well, this is rubbish. This is not how science works. And the terms theory and law have two very different meanings in science and two very explicit meanings, ones that we want to have a look at very specifically. The first of these, and probably the most important of these, is that uh, or, or at least the most important distinction, is that a theory is an explanation while a law is a description. Two examples that you may be familiar with uh, to help identify this might be Boyle's law. Now, Boyle's law is a relationship between pressure and volume for gases. Very simply, if you have a syringe and you have a certain number of moles of gas in that syringe, and you change the volume, that is you squeeze those particles into a smaller space, we would find that the pressure would increase. There, was, there is a direct relationship, a direct proportional relationship between pressure and volume that is known as Boyle's law. P1 V1 equals P2 V2. Now there are conditions for that. Temperature, for example, needs to stay the same, and the number of particles, the number of moles also needs to stay the same. But if they are, there's a direct relationship between the pressure and volume in the first instance um, prior to the compression, and then pressure and volume in the second instance after the compression. Now that tells us what the pressure is going to be when we change the volume, but it doesn't tell us why it changes. To figure out why it changes, we need a theory, we need an explanation. The best is the particle theory of matter. That is, that matter is made up of little tiny particles and when you squeeze them into a smaller space, if you have the same number of particles and you squeeze them into a smaller space, they bump into each other and into the walls of the container more often than they would if they're in a larger space and that creates extra pressure. That's the relationship between the theory, the explanation of why pressure changes when you compress the volume or change the volume. Um, and Boyle's law is the specific mathematical relationship between pressure and volume when you are uh, undertaking that, uh, that process. Newton was unapologetic in developing his laws around gravitation, which were very elegant mathematical laws without ever saying anything about why gravity worked, how the moon influences the tides. He just told us that it did, and he could mathematically calculate how it did, but he didn't say why it did. When discussing the law of gravitation in his Principia, uh, Sir Isaac Newton wrote, hitherto we have explained the phenomena of the heavens and of our sea by the power of gravity, but we have not yet assigned the cause of this power. I have not been able to discover the cause of those properties of gravity from phenomena, and I frame no hypothesis. For whatever is not deduced from the phenomena is to be called an hypothesis, and hypotheses, whether metaphysical or physical, whether of occult qualities or mechanical, have no place in experimental philosophy. Thank you, Sir Isaac. A second misconception is around scientific laws and theories as absolute. What we found out from the work of Liederman and others is that science is tentative and it's dynamic in nature. It continues to change. Newton described gravitation as a force between two masses, but Einstein said that gravitation is the result of the curvature of space-time. So the very concept of mass 
is understood quite differently in Newtonian physics to what it is in Einsteinian physics. A third misconception is a hypothesis is an educated guess. Hypotheses actually are predictive statements, and these are based on contemporary scientific concepts form the basis of experimentation or other scientific endeavors. They are more than just random guesses that we might make or throw out um, as just throwaway statements. But they should have some measure of experimentation or investigation invested in them. Darker colored surfaces absorb more energy than lighter colored surfaces may be a hypothesis. Now it's one for which there would have been a number of different experiments carried out, but certainly one that I could carry out or you could carry out to determine the veracity of that particular statement. The second area we want to look at is the scientific method. And there are a number of misconceptions associated with the scientific method. The first, a general and universal scientific method exists. The reality is that the steps of the scientific method are used to communicate research findings primarily rather than representing the research process itself. And that, that's why you will find a lot of scientific papers that are written in a form that matches the scientific method, yet don't necessarily describe a process that has been true to that method. Research processes are often highly varied, and there's no real universal methodology that all scientists use. In fact, so pervasive is this misconception that one of the Nobel laureates, Peter Medawar, called the scientific paper a fraud since it rarely reflects how the problem was investigated. It means that we need to reflect on our basic scientific report structure to ensure that it is not only relevant, but reflective of our investigation. Another misconception associated with the scientific method is that evidence accumulated carefully will result in certain knowledge. In science, the approach of generating theory from evidence data is called induction. However, a related but complementary process called hypothetical deduction, or just deduction, verifies the theories produced by induction. An example perhaps to demonstrate this is that after examining numerous plant and animal specimens under the microscope, the German scientists Schleiden and Schwann generalized that all living things are composed of basic blocks called cells. This process is an example of inductive thinking. Together with other findings, this generalization came to be called the cell theory. Another misconception is that science and its methods provide absolute proof. Well, I am hoping that you haven't got this far in your scientific careers by thinking that scientists are all about trying to prove things correct. Through experimentation and observation, scientific processes disprove that which is false. Self-correcting processes are inherent in science, and it's the reason why scientific thinking is powerful. Some simple and silly examples give you an idea about science and proof. If I say the statements, all grass is green or all swans are white, and these are my hypotheses, and I try and provide you with mountains of grass and white swans, that's not proving my hypothesis at all. Of course, if you can find a black swan, or some brown grass, then you've proven my hypothesis to be incorrect. And often that's more easy, uh, more easily proven, uh, particularly if there are flaws in my hypothesis, then it is for me to simply try and provide sufficient uh, amount of evidence to prove that my hypothesis is correct. Another misconception is that science is more procedural than creative. For science, there's no standard scientific method that all scientists follow. We've talked about that. When studying combustion, Joseph Priestley explained the process using the phlogiston theory, even though he'd isolated oxygen, while Lavoisier described combustion in terms of the reaction of substances with oxygen. Two men working at different times, similar time frames, um, using different types of understandings to explain things in different ways. The procedure was important, but the creativity and the ability to see things that are not there is often how science moves forward. Another misconception that kind of links into our idea of the scientific method is that science and its methods can answer all questions. And hopefully that's a misconception that we can move away from. While science explores natural phenomena, it cannot investigate paranormal, 
or supernatural events, and certainly religious beliefs are non-scientific because they cannot be falsified and validated through the hypothetical deductive process. Science can also invest uh, also cannot investigate questions involving ethics, morality, aesthetics, philosophy, metaphysics. That doesn't mean it has nothing to say in these areas, but it does mean that there is going to be that demarcation line between science and non-science or pseudoscience. And it's very important that we understand that science, as much as we may rely on it, as much as we may find it critically important in our lives, doesn't have the final say in all areas of our lives. Another misconception is that scientists are objective. Well, most scientists subconsciously hold on to certain preconceptions about how the world works. And these preconceptions may influence or bias the ways that scientists collect and interpret evidence. And we will again have a look at a little bit of that later on too. Scientists may consider a piece of evidence to be irrelevant to his or her research and therefore might exclude it from an ensuing publication. However, other scientists may consider the omitted evidence to be very important. Such judgment calls are the result of theory-dependent observation. While a researcher may not be objective in his or her investigation, the peer review process and collaborative nature of science maximizes objectivity. Independent verification of data analyses and scientific conclusions impart objectivity to a scientific enterprise. Another misconception is that experiments are the principal route to scientific knowledge. And although experiments are central to the scientific process, they're not the sole means of acquiring scientific knowledge. Einstein was famous for his thought experiments, the development of heliocentrism by Copernicus and Kepler, Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, Einstein's theories of relativity were all products of detailed observations or from extensions and elaborations of contemporary ideas in science. But it can also be argued that many of these had a creative, imaginative side to them. They were, they were put forward by people who looked at the world in a slightly different way to the way that most of their contemporaries were looking at it. Scientific conclusions are reviewed for accuracy. Well, science is a peer review process, and that's what ensures the accuracy and authenticity of research. I can publish anything I want on the web. That doesn't make it science. If I want to put it into a scientific journal, then I know I'm going to have some of my peers read that first. And I'm going to have the peers chosen that are experts in the field in which I have written my paper. So I'm not just going to have random scientists read it, I'm going to have people who understand my theories, understand my experiments, and can make sensible deductions on my conclusions. In fact, they can make conclusions of their own and determine whether I've been consistent in my application of logic to the results that I've achieved. This is how science moves forward. And this is how science seeks to um, ensure some level of objectivity. But as we looked at when we talked about uh, Liederman's definition, scientists aren't objective, they are subjective. And sometimes the processes that we have in science are designed to try and remove some of that subjectivity to try and keep things relatively objective. A third area where we might talk about scientific misconceptions is the area of scientific knowledge. And a couple of these hopefully will suffice um, to, to get you an idea of some of these misconceptions. Acceptance of new scientific knowledge is straightforward. Well, no, briefly it isn't. It's very difficult for new ideas to be accepted by the scientific community. Professional skepticism is a trait that's characteristic of science. Scientists also set the standards by which new information is incorporated as scientific knowledge. As an example, many theories that are mainstream today took a long time to become established in the scientific community. For example, sun-centered solar system and germ theory of disease, evolution by natural selection and continental drift were, if not ridiculed, um, not treated seriously in uh, when they first were developed or released or published, and it took some time for the scientific community to shift to these different ways of thinking. Another misconception that science models represent reality, and we've already asked you as you've got to this stage of your science careers to talk about models, to talk about the accuracy or the limitations of models, and to build models for a number of different types of things. And often models are representations of very, very large things we want to study, like the solar system, 
or very, very tiny things that we want to study, like the atom. In science, it really depends on your view. Realists claim that laws and theories are indeed representations of reality, that is, models and theories that are real, whereas instrumentalists suggest that laws and theories are instruments for understanding reality, but not real in themselves. Since scientific knowledge is tentative and subject to modification, these models can't be real and are only as useful as their capacity to explain natural phenomena. And that's the bottom line with scientific models. We need them to be explanatory. We need them to be able to help us understand how something works. Now that could be um, understand a law. It could also be understand the theory behind why those relationships occur, but they have to have some sort of explanatory power. From the works of the Greek philosophers to the contemporary standard model of the atom, our understanding of atomic structure has undergone significant change. Still no one has seen an atom. And yet our standard model explains many of the aspects of the structure and function of matter, which is everything from chemical bonding, chemical reactions to gas laws. This model explains many observations about the structure and properties of matter, despite the fact that it's undergone a series of revisions uh, over historical time. But even today, atoms are invisible and we don't know what they look like. We only uh, we build models to represent the way that they behave in all of the different experiments that we've been able to carry out involving atoms. A final misconception that science is a solitary pursuit. In science, even the great discoveries made by seeming solitary scientists like Newton or Einstein were the result of extensive collaboration and or communication with other scientists. And one of the things that I want to impress on you is the importance of collaboration in science. Darwin, who's known at being reclusive, communicated extensively with other scientists, including Alfred Russell Wallace. And it was very important that he did because Wallace co-developed the idea of speciation resulting from natural selection. And in fact, it was a letter that uh, Darwin received from Wallace that made him get his act together and publish, or otherwise he would have been gazumped by uh, Wallace, who was coming to very similar conclusions to the ones that Darwin had been sitting on for 20 years. The CERN experiment to determine the existence of the Higgs boson, which is another recent um, finding uh, at the Large Hadron Collider, included around about 5,000 scientists. So this idea of science being a solitary pursuit is just simply another misconception. Thanks for watching.